Welcome here to Worship for ABK Church. It's Sunday the 14th of February. My name is Andrew and let me welcome you here wherever you're watching or engaging with us from today. I hope you've been um, keeping well during these um, pretty cold um, days this past week or so. I'm pr pretty um, glad that uh, I don't live in Braemar after its record uh, minus 23 temperature the other night. Minus 5 I think it got to here and that's cold enough for us here, but I hope you're keeping safe and warm. And uh, a reminder, um, just particularly with all this cold weather, if there's anything that we can do to help you, if you need something picked up in the shops or anything we can do, um, then please be in touch and we'd love to be there for you and help and serve in any way that we can. We are thinking about um, Jesus today as we're going to be exploring some of the Gospel of John about Jesus' best friend says about him. Let me read some verses from Philippians um, of what Paul says about who Jesus is. He writes this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus. And Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking upon the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of people. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given to him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Paul writes about this magnificence of who Jesus was, that he came from heaven to earth to live among us, to die in our place. And now he is exalted and reigns as the Lord and God of everything. And it's that Jesus that we're going to be um, thinking about in our first song this morning. Margaret's going to play for us as we worship God by singing, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yours is the all-surpassing greatness, the unspeakable goodness, the superabundant grace. Lord, we cannot begin to comprehend the vastness and the majesty of all that you are and all that you have done for us. That you have come to rescue us and make us your people, adopting us and making us your children. When we were far from you, you have come close to us and you've welcomed us. You've opened up your arms and the wonders and the glory of heaven and you've welcomed us in. Lord, we cannot begin to understand that. But yet we know it is true. For we have seen the goodness and the grace of Jesus that has been revealed to us. And we have trusted in him. And we thank you that you have made a way for us. That when we were far from you, you came close to us. That when we had sinned and fallen short, you have forgiven us through Christ. Lord, as we worship you this morning, may you help us to catch a greater glimpse, a greater understanding of the vastness of your grace, the depths of your love towards us. Lord, may we see again the real Jesus, the one who has always loved us, who has died and risen for us. In our worship this morning, as we pray, as we read and as we hear your word, as we sing praise to you, may you delight to be with us in our homes, wherever we are. May you be very close and tangible there as we worship and as we love you. Be close to us, we pray. Help us to draw near to you as you have first drawn near to us. We ask all these things in the name of our Saviour and our hope, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. A couple of announcements for our church family today. The first is that we are launching something new called Bags of Blessing. We know that so many people in our community are struggling at the moment as lockdown continues and that's just really weary for us, not being able to see family or friends. And with the cold and damp weather we've had recently, maybe some have not been able to go outside and enjoy a walk or to meet up with a friend and go for a walk together. And so we want to provide something that will encourage and serve and show love to those who are most vulnerable, most isolated um, and uh, they're struggling um, quite a lot at the moment in our community. So we're trying to aim for at least a hundred bags of blessing where little bags will be filled with different goodies, things to encourage and serve people um, to give them joy in the midst of the continued lockdown. And there's three ways that we want you to get involved with this. The first, we'd love you to pray about it and um, pray that we would get the bags filled quickly and that we would get them out to the people um, who really need them and that they'd be blessed by them. So please do be praying for our Bags of Blessing initiative. The second thing is that we need some money um, for this um, and uh, like many charities and businesses during the pandemic, um, we've been hit quite hard financially and um, but we really believe that we want to serve our community rather than keeping the wealth or any money to ourselves. We want to bless and continue to love our community. Um, but we would really appreciate any help financially that um, you're able to provide for us. We know some of you might not be able to provide, but some of us might have some money we didn't spend on holidays or other things during the pandemic. So if you can um, give, then the ways to give are on your screen now or in the description box below. Anything you can give, um, as a one-off or a regular donation to the work of the church um, would be so gratefully received and will go a long way to serving our community. And the third thing is that more information will come out in the next few days, but we want you to get involved with helping us to fill the bags and with different things. We might be looking for some homemade um, things at home if you're able to do that. Or if you know someone that could receive a bag, then we'll be asking you in the next couple of weeks to take a bag and take it to your friend or neighbour or loved one in the community who would need that most. So if you can get involved in any of these ways by praying, by giving, or in the next few days um, serving um, by giving them out or contributing to them, then uh, we'd love for you to get involved with this in a way to serve and love our community in the way that Jesus has first loved us.
Last week we concluded our series looking through the book of Jonah as we saw the greatness and the wonder of God's grace to us even though we are rebels. But today we move into another um, book of the Bible that begins with the letter J and that is John's Gospel. John is someone who is um, a friend of Jesus, in fact, Jesus' best friend. And he writes one of the four Gospels, the four accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. And we're going to be um, searching that today and finding out about who Jesus really is. In early March, it will mark two years since I came to ABK Church as the minister here. And when I began, we started to look through the Gospel of John, right from chapter 1, verse 1. And we, um, over the last couple of years, we've dipped in and out and explored part of what Jesus' best friend says about him. And so we finished just around the time the pandemic hit last March. Um, we concluded uh, in chapter 6. And so today we're going to pick up in chapter 7 and find out more about what John says about Jesus. And as we've been going along, we've been trying to increasingly find out about who Jesus is. Because that's what John says his book is all about. If you remember almost at the end of his gospel, he concludes chapter 20 by saying this. Jesus performed many other signs or miracles in the presence of his disciples. And these are not recorded in this book. But these ones that I have written down are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing in him you may have life in his name. John wants us to see Jesus for all that he is and was and to trust in him and to know him as our friend and our saviour and ultimately to find life, eternal life, by trusting in him. And so as we turn again to John's gospel over these next few weeks, let me encourage you once again to have open hearts and eyes and ears to hear and see and understand what John writes about Jesus, about his best friend, about this man he spent three or so years of his life with, learning from him, understanding him and growing to know him as a saviour and a lord. So but let me sum up what chapters one to six have so far taught us about Jesus. Well, John opens up his tremendous account with these wonderful words describing Jesus as the word of God. The word was with God and the word was God, he says, telling us that God himself has come from heaven to earth to take upon himself human flesh, that he's become like us. He says that Jesus is God with us, that he's no ordinary human like you and I, but rather he is God among us, God in our midst. He then introduces an older cousin of Jesus, a man also by the name of John. And John says it's my job to point people to Jesus, my younger cousin, He's the one that God is sending into the world to transform it and bring us back to God. We see Jesus, a miracle worker, the one who heals, who turns barrel loads of water into wine, who causes a disabled man who's been disabled for 40 years to walk and run again, who feeds a whole mountainside with just a packed lunch, who walks on water in the middle of a storm. He tells people they've got to be born again to be saved. He tells people from an enemy nation, an enemy culture, that he really is the Son of God. He says in the conclusion of chapter 6, we finished back last March, that he is a bread of life, the one in whom we can find nourishment for our souls within. That's a lot crammed in to the last, um, the first six chapters. But now we jump into chapter 7 and Richard is going to read for us the first 13 verses of chapter 7. And it's going to be reading the message version. Later Jesus was going about his business in Galilee. He didn't want to travel in Judea because the Jews were looking for him for a chance to kill him. It was near the time of the tabernacles, a feast observed annually by the Jews. His brother said, why don't you leave here and go up to the feast so your disciples can get a good look at the works you do? No one who intends to be publicly no one does anything, everything behind the scenes. If you're serious about what you're doing, come out in the open and show the world. His brothers were pushing him like this because they didn't believe in him either. Jesus came back at them. Don't crowd me. 
This isn't my time, it's your time. It's always your time, you have nothing to lose. The world has nothing against you, but it's up in arms against me. It's against me because I expose the evil behind its pretensions. You go ahead, go up, in, go up to the feast. Don't wait for me, I'm not ready. It's not the right time for me. He said this and stayed on in Galilee. But later, after his family had gone up, gone up to the feast, he also went. But he kept out of the way, careful not to draw attention to himself. The Jews were already out looking for him, asking around, where is that man? There was a lot of contentious talk about him circulating through the crowds. Some were saying, he is a good man. The other said, not so, he's selling snake oil. This kind of talk went on in guarded whispers because of the intimidating Jewish leaders. Amen. So who is Jesus? This is a question that you and I have got to grapple with in this life. Over these next few weeks, we're going to see John begin to unfold that and help us to understand who Jesus really is, what he says about himself and what others think about him. Let me just say that Jesus is the most famous person in all of history. More books have been written about him, more songs have been sung to him, more paintings painted of him than anyone else who's ever lived in the history of the world. The Christian church is the biggest movement of any sort or kind in the history of our planet. There is no one bigger than Jesus. In fact, we measure time from before Jesus and after Jesus, and it's split right down from the moment that he was born. The biggest holiday in all of our world is the one that celebrates his birthday, Christmas. For someone with no electricity, no media, no social media, no public relations firm, no offspring, no money, no power, no soldiers, no business card, no Twitter account, no office, Jesus Christ is somehow, he's become the most towering figure in all of human history. He accomplished this in just three short years of his ministry, a ministry that took place in the middle of nowhere, walking around and preaching to mainly rural folks, including illiterate presence, without the benefit of live internet streaming. H.G. Wells, a man who wasn't a Christian, said this, No man can write a history of the human race without giving first and foremost place to the penniless Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is a really important figure in all of history. And we've got to try and understand who he is and answer that question, who is Jesus? Well, these verses that Richard read for us in the beginning of chapter seven, we see within them people who don't really understand who Jesus is. There's lots of misconceptions, misunderstandings, misapprehensions about who he is. The dominant focus of these verses, John writes for us, is what people's wrong opinions about Jesus are. There are views that were held back then and views that are sometimes held today as well. The passage begins with the brothers of Jesus telling us their thoughts about their big brother. In verses three or four, John writes for us, telling us that the brothers of Jesus were saying to him, go up to Jerusalem and show everyone what you can do. But also, he says, that they did not believe that he really was the real deal. And so they cry out to Jesus, go and show everyone what you can do. Don't do it here in the middle of nowhere where no one can see what you can really do. Head to the city and to the big festival that's going on. Show off your fancy miracle skills. Now it seems like they knew that Jesus was special, but rather than seeing him as the Messiah, the one that God was sending into the world, John writes that they did not believe in him. Perhaps they thought that he was a political messiah, one who could deliver Israel from the clutch of the Roman oppression that was around them at that time. If the miracles of Jesus meant that he really was a political saviour, then he needed to establish some big political movement, some following from the authorities and the leaders of the people, from the mass of people who were in the city of Jerusalem for their annual festival of tabernacles rather than doing all this stuff in the obscure villages in the back of beyond. The thing is, the brothers of Jesus had a complete misunderstanding of who Jesus was and what his mission was all about. 
They thought Jesus was all about the power and the fame, all about political upheaval against the enemy Roman nation. They wanted the publicity, the control, the dominance that Jesus could bring to their nation. And that kind of feeling sometimes exists within the church today. Many of us might remember a time in the church when it had more influence in society, when it was shaped, when it shaped the culture and it shaped the morality of the people around them, regardless of their own personal faith. I'm not even 30 yet, and I can remember times and assemblies when I was a child where we would sing hymns regularly, the same kind of hymns that we might sing on a Sunday. I've seen in my lifetime how fast Scotland has moved away from its biblical moorings that it might have clung to in the past. And for many of you older than I am, you perhaps struggle to grapple with the fact of how much society has changed in your lifetime, where you see the, the change in society and what it believes and how it thinks and how it acts. You've seen the decline of the church, the loss of its influence in society. You've seen the plethora of abandoned church buildings or ones that have turned into pubs or housing or just been demolished. And it's tempting to turn back to that, to want that kind of influence in society again. Demand that people follow our faith, that they follow the ways and the morals of the way of God. That kids should sing hymns at school again. That things in society should stop on a Sunday so that people can come to worship but the thing is that Jesus, the real Jesus, doesn't seem to want that in the Bible. He doesn't go for that. We see Jesus as a servant, as someone who's humble. He doesn't seek the limelight or demand that people follow him in the way that others want him to be followed. Rather, through his overwhelming grace and radical love, he shakes society and the culture to its core. He sends his followers, you and me, into the world to be salt and light, to be influencers. Not with swords, not with political power, not with dominance in the kingdom, but by bringing the kingdom of God to reign in our lives and then through that to reign in the society around us as the Holy Spirit works within us. Now that's not to say you can't sign petitions or um, make protests about big things. In fact, this week I've contacted elected representatives twice about big things. But Jesus also says, love your enemies. Give generously to God's work in the world. Love the broken and the trampled upon in society. Tell people about the good news of Jesus, that he's coming to change the world. And he wants to invite them to be part of it. That's how Jesus turned the world upside down. Not by swords, not by dominance, not by controlling and ruling over everything. But by changing the world. One person, one life, one um, mindset at a time. We are called to do the same as we love people in the way that Jesus first loved us. But the brothers weren't the only ones who had a wrong view of Jesus in that time. The Jewish leaders also had a wrong view of Jesus. They had a hostile view towards him. As we explore into the rest of chapter 7 over these next couple of weeks and the next couple of chapters of John's Gospel, we'll see the leaders of the people at that time becoming increasingly hostile towards the person and the teaching of Jesus. In fact, right from the opening word of, or the opening verse of this chapter, it says that Jesus didn't go around the area where he lived that much because he knew that people were out there trying to kill him. And then in verses 19 and 20, he asks them, why are you trying to kill me? Later on in the chapter, it says that they attempt to seize him and the guards are sent to arrest him. And in verses 59 of chapter 8, people try and throw stones at him and try to kill him by that method before he manages to get away. Jesus, in chapter 7, shows up in Jerusalem eventually. And people at that time are trying to find him. Not to get more of his miracles and his teaching or his autograph, but because he's a wanted man. The leaders are trying to find him and arrest him and put, the, put him out of their sight and out of the, the hearing of the people around them. There's wanted posters saying, find this man all around Jerusalem. The police have a description of him. Jesus is a fugitive on the run. They were threatened by what he said. They wanted to shut him up and shut him down. He was a rebel, a political insurrectionist, at least that's what they thought. 
Jesus, I guess, was in some way equivalent to the current news story of Alexei Navalny in Russia, who's on the news an awful lot at the moment. He was like that kind of person, someone the authorities were trying to shut up and, and move to the margins and not get any limelight or any prominence amongst the people any longer because Jesus threatened their power. And they used their power to control the people through fear. He didn't fit in with their idea of what a political messiah might be. When he upset the money changers at the temple in chapter 2, he threatened their income. They didn't listen to Jesus' teaching or to think rationally about the miracles that he did. Because if they had, they'd have seen him for what he really is, that he is the son of God. That he is the one that God was sending into the world to bring around the new kingdom. Jesus threatened their comfortable way of life. And in the same way today, there are some who don't believe in Jesus for similar reasons. Now, the facts all point in one direction, that Jesus really is the one to whom our knees should bow. But the reaction that some have is emotional rather than rational. By that I mean that they look at what they would lose if Jesus really was the Lord of their life, and they don't want to lose that. Because coming to Jesus would mean an end to their plans and their prestige, their control over their own lives. They like the comfortable lives that they have. They don't want to face the truth that they are rebels against a holy God. And so people today, in some parts of the world, and some parts of our culture, want to shut Jesus down and move him to the side far from anyone having a chance to come close to him. So, so far we've seen two views of the person of Jesus. And there's one more view that the people have. And the crowds have this view, and that's an inadequate or mixed up view of who Jesus is. There were some muttering about him among the people. Some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet because of the fear of the Jewish leaders, no one spoke openly about him. The crowds were discussing amongst themselves about who Jesus was. They didn't want to speak openly because, well, the leaders of the time, big brother, if you will, they might overhear them. But the people were divided into two camps when they thought about Jesus, and both of them were unfortunately wrong. Some say, well, he's just a good man. Now, that's true as far as it goes, but it didn't go anywhere near close enough to what it should, as John's Gospel demonstrates. John Stott, famous Anglican um, uh, vicar from the past, said this. He says, if Jesus was not God in human flesh, his claims would have meant that he was not a good man, but a very self-centred man. Because he was always talking about himself and telling people that they should believe in him as the only way to have everlasting life. He claimed that the Old Testament was written all about him. He claimed to be the bread of life who could satisfy the hunger of all who came to him. He claims that whoever believes in him would have rivers of flowing waters flowing from his innermost being. He claims to be the light of the world. He claims that before Abraham was born many thousands of years previously, there he existed as well. No good man who was not God in human flesh could say such things without being considered a deluded megalomaniac. Jesus wasn't just a good man. He was and he is the God man. And there was this other group of people as well who were speaking at the time. And they saw Jesus as a charlatan, as someone who's leading people astray, far from the true beliefs of the Jewish faith. To be a, an Israelite was to be Jewish. And they all believed what God had said in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's called the Shema. It's the foundation of the Jewish belief system. But here was Jesus coming in with this new teaching that he was also God. And the people couldn't understand that. They couldn't grasp that. And so they think that Jesus is coming in to deceive people and to take them away from the real faith. But Jesus did manage to convince some of these fiercely monotheistic Jews to believe his claims to be God as well. So many that they began to suffer um, persecution, some even suffering martyrdom because of their belief in him. And if he was a deceiver, if he really was leading people astray, he would be so evil. 
because he deliberately led people away from God, even though he knew that he was not telling the truth. We need to have in our understanding the real Jesus, the real Jesus of the real Bible, the Jesus that John writes about and he wants you to know in and believe in and to trust in and be saved by. He wants you to know that Jesus, the real Jesus of the Bible, the one who cloaks his glory in humility, who descends from the, the magnificence of heaven to the chaos of this world, who's despised and rejected by his own people, who takes upon himself the sin and the shame of the world, bearing the wrath that should have been ours upon his very own shoulders. Do you know this Jesus, who died and rose again to give you everlasting life and a hope in heaven? For the real Jesus is the only one who can offer you real forgiveness when you trust in him. Anything less than the real Jesus will leave you really disappointed. And let me tell you, after following Jesus for around half of my life now, I've never been disappointed by him. People have disappointed me, but Jesus never has. Complete forgiveness, total redemption, reconciliation with God the Father, and the promise of everlasting life in a new, wonderful, perfect kingdom, all given freely by the real Jesus of the real Bible. What a gift. What a blessing. May you trust in him and know him today. Amen. Father, we're living through difficult times, but we've seen Jesus and we thank you so much for that. Jesus said, if we've seen him, we've seen you. So we know what you're like, full of amazing love for us, willing to do anything, to give even your own son, to bring us the joy of life in abundance, eternal life. So we come to you in confidence that you will listen to our prayers and answer them. We pray especially today for those most affected by the current pandemic. Just as Jesus never turned away from and always reached out with immense love and with healing to the sick who were brought before him, those damaged physically and mentally, and those suffering long-term chronic illness, so we bring our sick before you today. All those in hospital, isolated from their loved ones and uncertain of the future, and all those who've lived at home with a physical or mental illness for years and are worn down and tired. We pray that you will reach out to them with great assurance of your love. In the silence, we bring those known to us who especially need your healing hand upon them just now. We pray also for those who are your hands and feet here on earth in this respect, the medical teams in hospitals and GP surgeries, battling new challenges daily, the carers paid or unpaid who are every day putting the well-being of others before themselves, the researchers and scientists who work to develop new cures and vaccines, and all those who support them. We pray that you will be with all of them to strengthen, inspire and encourage. We thank you for their resilience, professionalism and compassion, and for the success you've given in treating patients and in developing vaccines in greater numbers and faster than we could have hoped. Just as Jesus deliberately reached out in love and acceptance to the isolated and unloved, to those isolated by circumstances, by gender, by race, by lifestyle, we pray that you will reach out to those in our lockdown society who feel especially isolated and unworthy at this time. We pray for those living alone and missing human contact, for the jobless missing the self-worth which comes from paid work, anxious about the future, for the retired, feeling that they can't contribute and often isolated from their own families. For the strangers in our communities, unable to connect and make new friends as they normally would. For the young, feeling overlooked and that life is passing them by. For the different, who don't feel accepted for who they are. We pray that you will reach out to them all with great assurance of your love. In the silence, we bring those known to us especially need your loving hand upon them just now. We pray also for those who are your hands and feet here on earth in this respect, society generally, and especially us, your church, who need to lead by your example. We pray that you will open our eyes, ears and hearts so that we reach out and get to know all your children, our family. Give us imagination, empathy and compassion to notice and understand the needs of others, 
in our local church, in the wider community and in the world, and find imaginative and fruitful ways to meet those needs, even while under these restrictions. We pray that you'll be with us when fatigued and discouraged to strengthen, inspire and encourage. We thank you for all the goodness and kindness we see, which we know comes from you. And just as Jesus had time for ordinary, invisible people, the fishermen whom he changed into heroes and leaders, the soldiers wanting to know what they could do and who were told to do their jobs, but honestly and contentedly, we pray that you will continue to be near all of us ordinary ones who have no particular problems to bring to you and aren't doing anything high profile or heroic, but just want to know that we are valued too. Equip us to serve you in the best way we can. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us here today as we've worshipped God together. And we pray that you would continue to grow in your knowledge and your love and your relationship with the real Jesus um, who has come for us and come to rescue us and save us and transform our world. And uh, just a reminder, if there's anything that we can do as a church to help you, please be in contact with us. And for those who are online watching live, um, please do join us for virtual coffee. Um, details are on your screen or in the description box below. We'd love to uh, find out how you're doing. If you've never joined us before, today's a, a brilliant day um, to come along and uh, spend some time with us. We'd love to see you there. But we ask that God would bless you and your families and your loved ones this week. May you have a great week. 
and we look forward to seeing you sometime soon. and cross.